Um, it's so, so great to be here. I'm Joanne Parsant. I'm the Director of Education for the California Film Institute. Um, so we actually work year round um, on doing education programs with schools all around the Bay Area. During the Mill Valley Film Festival, which happens every fall, this is our 44th year, um, we have a special program, our MDFF education program, um, where we have a, you know, a concentration of films that we're able to share with schools. Normally, we bring you guys to the theater, uh, we sometimes bring filmmakers out to classrooms, but this year, of course, we we're not able to bring anyone to the theater, so we were pretty overjoyed that we were able to come to your new theater, and it's spectacular. We're so excited to work with you guys and to do this. But it means that you are literally the only school group that are getting to really see films and meet filmmakers in person this year because you have this incredible resource. Um, so uh, the, the festival uh, runs through, through Sunday. It's an 11-day festival. We have all kinds of films in the festival, narrative features, documentary features, short films, uh, independent films, a few bigger films that are going to be um, award track films. This film is one of those films. This was actually our centerpiece film last night. So one of its very first screenings happened last night for our audience. You guys are one of the first audiences to get to see it. It also was a very big deal for them to agree to even send us a screener for you guys to watch because they're extra secure before they have a theatrical release about what they're willing um, you know, to let people see. And they were so eager for you guys to see this film. Um, the distributor, A24, they agreed to do that. Um, and they're even bringing some of their publicity reps and everything to come with the filmmaker. Like this is a really big deal for all of them and um, to be able for you guys to see it. And, um, and it's a really big deal for us to be able to share it with you. They don't normally let us do this. So um, as, as Philip mentioned, Mike Mills is a pretty renowned director. We've had him at the festival several times before for both of those other films, Beginners that starred Christopher Plummer um, and uh, 20th Century Women that starred Annette Bening. Um, this film is really unique. Uh, it, it, is, it is in black and white, prepare yourself for that. Um, and uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more in the Q&A about you know, those creative choices. Um, but it's also a very unique film kind of about family dynamics and relationships, sibling dynamics, um, parenting dynamics, but it's also very much from the perspective of its youngest protagonist, who's only nine. So there's a lot of really incredible layers. There's also an incredible subtext around um, youth voice and um, what young people your age are actually feeling about the world that um, I think makes this a really unique and, ex and interesting experience for you guys. So it might be different from other films you've seen before, but I think there's gonna be a lot for us to dig into um, in the Q&A after, which um, my colleague uh, Shakira Rifos will run with Mike Mills um, um, afterwards. Yeah, and we'll be back for Q&A after. And please, you know, I know we're going to be bleeding a little into your lunch hour, but um, I just hope you'll take the opportunity to stick around. As I said, really, you know, he's, he's coming. He flew in from LA. He's rushing up here from doing um, press in the city today and is just really excited to meet and talk to you guys. So I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. We look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, Mr. Mike Mills, Mike, is a director of Come On, Come On, and you guys had the pleasure of seeing a film that has not come out yet. It's really awesome to be here, I have to say. It's weird. <laughs> to be back in high school? Yeah. <laughs> and to have an audience of high school kids watch my movie, I'm really, I thank you guys for watching it. It's like, it's, Let's get one more. Let's get one more person from the creative writing class to give their input. Yes. What motivated you or inspired you to start writing? Uh huh. And saying, you know what? I'm gonna make it. All right. That's really hard um, for me. Um, I I don't have a lot of faith in myself at often. And when you start writing, it's really easy to lose faith or just feel like, oh, this is sucks. I suck. My, let's go to bed. Um, and so I have to talk myself into it a lot. I have to come up with a lot of things I love or, or I find interesting to kind of like keep me company, right? It's really lonely too, right? Writing, you, you're just with yourself and if you have any little self-hatred tendencies, they all love to come and hang out with you when you're writing and I, I have that. So um, the inspiration for this was my kid uh, who I adore and who's really quite um, an amazing person. And being their dad was mind-blowing and transformative. Someday, maybe some of you will experience that. And it's, um, it, it really changes your life. It really changes everything you see, your understanding of yourself. And I wanted to try to write about that. And, and also what it's like to try to give the kids in my movie power and full respect. So 
Mike, you, what I like to, when we talk to students, I always kind of want to like make the conversation super relatable in the sense of like, let's talk about you when you were in high school. Oh, cool. I mean, you're like a renaissance man as an artist. You do graphic design. You're very close to a lot of musicians. If any of you have done your research here, um, you're close to musicians. You've done a lot of graphic design for albums. You've directed music videos. You're a writer. Mm -hmm. You're a director in film. Mm -hmm. But when you were their age, mm. you don't want this answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, how old are you guys? Like 15 to 18, something like that? Yeah. You really don't want this answer. Um, well, I, I had the fortune of going to a performing arts school when uh, I was in high school, and that really helped me like open yeah. up and find that confidence yeah. that well, I, you're okay. talking about. Okay, well, I have a similar thing. So when I was that age, um, I went to Santa Barbara Public High School, and it was 1980, way back then. Um, and there's a lot of lovely things at that school, and there's a lot of not lovely or conscious or awesome things at that school. And um, the things that really turned me on were skateboarding and the world of culture I met through skateboarding, which was really awesomely driven by all the, the peers, all my friends who were doing it. Uh, and skateboarding, I lived in Santa Barbara, you go down to LA for contests, you meet like kind of more sophisticated kids. They're all into punk. I learned about punk music was like really important to me. It showed me like a different way to be. It showed me different like emotional places I could be. It, it was like really um, criticizing and critical of like a lot of the norms around me, right? And so all that was like super powerful. Um, and then I, so I wanted to be a professional skateboarder, not gonna work out, right? And then I wanted to be in a band and I was in bands and that was huge to me um, and performing and creating and making stuff and being your own author and just like going for it, right? Just like, that was a great thing about punk culture. If you, if you guys wish I'd like to share with you is it really taught you that like, you don't know, how, you don't have to know how to play. No one has to tell you that it's your turn. You just go do it, right? And that was really just alive and really empowering and awesome. And then, so the punk thing also wasn't gonna work out. I could smell that my band wasn't going anywhere. And so then, uh, luckily I could draw, because I was a horrible student. I was a horrible student, and I didn't pay attention. Me too. <laughs> and I didn't um, engage. <laughs> and so I started taking a lot of art class. I could do three art classes at my school. I could do, after lunch, I could do art for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. I had these three amazing art teachers who like, were just cool to hang out with and nice, and like got my band, would come see my band, right? And I would just do like art for my band all day long. And they would like, let it happen, right? They just let me be. And that was really lovely. And, um, but I was, yeesh, can't share some of this stuff. Um, uh, so I was lucky I had all that. And then at the end, like my last year, I got really into like literature and had a couple great teachers in that direction. And man, the, like one teacher yeah. can, change everything, so it's kind of wild, yeah. Mr. Stathakis, I, got I, us into Herman Hess. I, I always say that like educators are superheroes. I mean, they're like the best people that we have in yeah. society to like make sure that, you know, we have like an, a healthy culture and students who are, com who are turning into confident adults. And there is always that one teacher. Yeah. For me, it was a social studies teacher who was like, come hang out with me. And I'm like, oh, I'm so gay. Everybody hates me. <laughs> and she was like, no, but you're like really good at did talking you, did to you, people. Did you articulate that to her? Sorry? Did you say that? Did you articulate that? Or you yeah. That? Yeah. Cool. I was, it was pretty clear pretty early on. Yeah, that's right. And she was like, no, but I was like, ah, I'm always getting in trouble. Like, and they're like, no, but that's your strength. You're like oh, a little rebellious. You talk to people. That's, so it's always that one, one teacher. I want to encourage students to ask questions, but before I do that, there is a lunch bell that is going to go off in a few minutes. I really encourage you all to stay for at least five or 10 more minutes. Can I take a picture for any of you leave? Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's do that. Let's oh, sorry. Do that. You, you, you keep going. Okay. Well, I just, I don't, if you guys leave, then I will have less of a... Oh, you, okay. You guys ready for this, for this photo? Okay. You make sure you get your angles right. You got, everybody got their angles? One more time. Is that everybody a... got their angles? Make sure you have your angles. 
Thank you. All right. Um, so I would like to get some questions from students. You can ask anything about the film, yeah. about Mike, um, Mike himself. You, would you like to call on students themselves? Sure. I, you were first, right? Yeah. And just make sure you stand up, take your mask off, and introduce yourself, please. Uh, Jonathan Durant. I was wondering what prompted you to make it black and white. Ah. Well, I, I love black and white films, and I'm just really pretentious, is one thing. <laughs> It's one honest answer. I, I love black and white films. So, my, so many of my favorite films are black and white. I study them, I watch them. So it's like, of course, I want to be like my heroes. I want to be like Fellini. I want to be like Casablanca. I want to be like so many things. Then when I was thinking of this movie, I kept just seeing the image of the man, the adult, and the kid. And I kept seeing like those two shapes, right? And, and it's kind of like a fairy tale almost, or it's like a fable. It's like an archetypal image mm -hmm. to me. And that reminds me of like Charlie Chaplin and the Kid, or reminds me of like Christopher Robin carrying Winnie the Pooh. It reminds me of like these kind of ancient fables. And black and white kind of helps you get to like a story fable space because it's like an abstraction from reality. And then like what was your you were talking about? You were asking me about how do I get inspired, and I was saying how you know how unsure I am really, right? So I had to talk myself into it. And one way I talked myself into it was it's a drawing, not a painting. And I went to art school. It's like drawing, I love drawing. And it's like simple, quick, fast, intimate, speedy. So, and I think of drawings as black and white. And like kind of like, it's not as big feeling as a painting, but actually I'm gonna sneak around and try to make it as big as a painting. Yeah. I think that was an answer. <laughs> You were next, yeah. Uh, throughout the movie, uh, the kid plays this like bit where he's like an orphan. Yeah. And then he does this like thing, like I'm pretty sure he did like twice throughout the movie, where he just ran, just straight up and ran away. Yeah. From his uncle. So I'm wondering if like if those two things were, are like connect, uh, connected at all. Ah. Uh, like, oh like, yeah. Really good question. No one's ever asked that. I've just been interviewed by a bunch of professionals for like a week. So you no can one's count that. on, you can always count on the students to notice the nuances and, yeah. and to bring up the things that you've never been asked before. Yeah. I didn't think of that, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like, that wasn't purposeful, but so many things in film or when you're writing are not purposeful. And it's just like, you gush out all the stuff and then your, your unconscious is genius and your conscious is like kind of getting by, right? So you're trying to like get to the unconscious as much. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But the orphan thing is my friend, Aaron Dessner, who did the music, his daughter does that, like exactly. And it was so interesting and wild. And, she, and they were talking about it. I was like, oh, can I please put that in my movie, like just word for word. And then the running away thing, my kid would do that once in a while. It scares the bejesus out of you, right? And as a parent. And uh, did it to me in Hyde Park in London. <gasps> And, and they, they're they, them, they loved it. And when I finally caught up with it again, I was like, just, I didn't want to cuss. I was just freaking out, right? And they're just like, ha, ha, ha. And um, so I put that in the movie. That's how I write. Yeah. Um, should I get out of this zone? Um, how about yeah, you? Over there uh, in the corner. Yeah, yeah. All the way in the, the corner. In the green, in the mossy green hand. Yes. Hi. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, totally. So you mean, do you mean just in like the normal scenes, you're really aware of, of the background sound? That's a really cool question. Awesome question. Um, so yeah, of course, because he's recording sound all the time, and just sound in general, it's just like a, it's like a character in the movie, right? And thinking about sound, because sound is presence to me. It's like time. You can't, time, sound is never still, right? Sound and time, sound can't be without time. It's ephemeral, temporal thing. And so time and sound to me are a way to think about being present. And having a kid, living with a kid, constantly knocks you out of your adult, weird, dream world and makes you very present, right. you know? Right. Um, if you guys need to go, you can go and enjoy your lunch and have an awesome day. Um, yeah. um, but to finish answering your question, black and white loves a lot of sound. It absorbs sound. So we, I put more sound into this movie than I ever, ever have. Yeah. 
What about you in the back over there? Uh, blue, blue and green, yes. Hi. Hi. They were all just kids, um, they're like 11 to 14 that we found in the different cities. And they're just documentary interviews. So um, they're, whatever you want to call it, real is real a word. <laughs> but they, um, Joaquin really loved doing those. And, um, and Molly Webster, who plays the radio partner, she's from Radiolab, she's not an actress. She's from that, I don't know if you guys ever listened to Radiolab, it's an awesome, awesome show. And she was, uh, I kept saying to my casting person, like, someone like Molly Webster, and they're like, Molly Webster comes in, yeah. <laughs> so those are all, whatever you want to call it, real. And when it was really impacted the film to go into people's houses, and we met, we kind of went end up circling around a school. So in New Orleans, there's a Homer Plessy School in the French Corner, it's an amazing school, amazing teachers. And in uh, Detroit, it was the Bog School. So these really special schools. Um, and yeah, those are those, those kids just saying their truth. Just about casting, real quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Jabuki is featured in yeah, this film, yeah, yeah. and I know some of these students might watch, have seen or watch Big Mouth yeah. um, and a few other things that, um, that he's done. Um, tell us what goes into casting, um, uh, supporting characters, and yeah. how you kind of made, made that decision. Yeah, so who knows Jabuki here? Like, who's seen him before? Just a few. Cool. Such a smart, wonderful person, right? And also, like, he's an, Jupik is a performer, an actor, he's more of like a comedian, right? Mm -hmm. So he's not like a traditional film actor, though. And I really like that. Like, I, also, Sonny Patterson, when they go to New Orleans and they go to that house, the woman who owns the house or, like, invites them in and does some of the interviews, she is a, like, poet, activist, New Orleans, you know, god. And so, but she doesn't come from, from, um, uh, a traditional acting background. So I really like um, mixing up mm. people with different, you know, you don't have to be an actor to be an amazing in a film. And especially with kind of secondary roles, especially if you're playing something that's a lot like who you are, like Molly's kind of playing a version of herself. She's never been in a movie. I think she's really amazing in this film. And um, Jabuki, um, I, I kind of feel like Jabuki's too big for the role he's in. You know, he's almost, he deserves a bigger role, and he, um, I don't know, he's done too much. He has too much of a signature to be in such a small thing, but he, but I, of course, I loved him, and he wanted to do it, and so I'm telling you, like, my, my one hesitancy, right? He, he's, um, he's just pretty brilliant. He deserves bigger, so I felt kind of bad, you know? Thank you. Let's get back to some student questions. Go ahead, now. Uh, maybe over, we haven't been over this side yet. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, because you wrote and directed. Yeah. So I was wondering how the screenplay changed when you were playing. Great question. Ooh. Um, yeah. So, OK. Some, some writer directors really like it to be like, I wrote the script, and you're going to say every word I did, and it's going to be just like I wrote it. I'm really interested in learning after I've written the script and keeping, the, keeping it alive, keeping discovering things. So, so many things came once we started, I started meeting the actors and all that. And how I got Joaquin to be in the movie was like, we just kept reading the script and thinking about it and he would have an idea and I'm like, oh, that was a good one. I, I'm gonna take that and write it down. And um, so it's constantly changing and then things like, you know, when he talks into the mic at the end of the day, often about like what he remembers, he had that idea. And it was based on some of the radio people that we were studying <clears throat> together. Like here's a reference. What about Scott Courier? I don't know if you guys know him. He's a great radio journalist, podcaster. And Joaquin really loved him. And he has this really funny way of talking. And he talks really, and he does like really amazing radio pieces. And Joaquin's like, what if I did something like that? And I was like, oh, I like that. Let's try it. So we shot an order so that we would plan like seven days in, Joaquin would do one of those things about everything that's happened before. So I would write some stuff to, to prompt him, but really he would just start remembering what he experienced. So it like felt like really alive and juicy. And I love that. I love when it's not all in my hands. And I got a lot of that from Fellini, who like life films are kind of spiritual, magical situations, just to be really pretentious. And they have their own, 
they come with their own personality, their own wants and needs, and they invite certain people and they disinvite other people, and that's not in your control even if you're the writer director. And it's your job to be like alive to that magic. And that's, I'm sorry, that sounds like, like magic is kind of a bad word in a way because it makes you feel like you can't touch it or something, or it's like, I'm not magic. He's talking about magic. I don't know magic, but we're all magic, right? It's just energy and being alive and being aware. Is that, yeah. No, no, no. I like that because there is like a certain like sweet spot you hit when you feel like you're in your confidence and you're like you're yeah. like doing what like what what feels good creatively. That's, that does feel kind of magical. I'm with you. That is. And you're like tied. You're yeah. tapping in to like the source. Yeah. Right. That's why. I want to I want to ask Rebecca real quickly. Um, so you you have creative writers here. Some of them have stayed. Hopefully. Um, is there anything that we can ask, that you can ask Mike, that will relate to what you're doing in, in class so that yeah. you can go back and, and work with that? Right now, most of them are writing their own original short scripts themselves. And they're at the early phase where they're coming up with the ideas and the yeah. characters and really trying to flesh into that. Like, what do they want? What's yeah. getting in the way of that? And maybe, I don't know, any advice or tips yeah. when they're in those early stages? Of That's the fun part. Uh, <laughs> So that's really a fun part. Um, advice. Um, trust yourself. Like, let it go. Just like, like, have a billion ideas. Don't worry if you're good or bad. You have to be like non judgmental at this phase, especially. Acquire, acquire, acquire. Or just like generate as many ideas and really don't be hard on yourself. You can do that later, right? You're going to do that later. So it's about inviting, exploring trusting just like any hunch uh, i don't know why i have no idea but i want to be in a boat on a river i have i can't explain it and that's rad right the, so and if it makes you happy that's a really good sign it's not so dumb and simple if it makes you smile if it makes you happy it makes you laugh woo, you're in the right track right if it's like oh this is important and it's not very fun and i'm not having a good time but it's important you're not on the right track you know i would say personally um and, and, it, and um, oh, I have a good one. It's actually from Ira Glass. Do you know This American Life? Do you guys ever listen to that? It's rad. He's a hero for me. He has this great thing. You could look it up. It's, it's called, I forgot what it's called. You can probably help them look it up. It's like when you're young, when you're young like you guys, or like when you get out of college, often your taste is really high. Like what you love is really high. Like if you're in a band, you're like, I love whatever, Radiohead, I love, I don't know, just name it. And, but my abilities are way down here because I'm young, you know, I'm just starting. And that discrepancy can make you stop, mm. right? It can make you feel defeated. I'm not as good as my heroes. And the whole, you just got to keep going. So you got to, here's what you have to do at that stage is endure being bad. Mm. Like have faith that it'll keep going. And you often don't know when you're going to start making it good or how or why and have faith in that. Like, I think, yeah. Um, like, let's see, who hasn't had a chance? Wow. How about you? What's the biggest struggle you've had while filming this or writing this? Biggest struggle while filming or writing this? Biggest struggle while filming or writing this. You want the honest answer? Yes. Um, well, well, maybe there's two really honest answers. There's one called capitalism. Ooh. Um, right? Like it's just making movies costs money. And so you have to like, you have to like, how are you going to pay him back? You know what I mean? In this case, it was Joaquin Phoenix after doing Joker. Like, let's just be straight up. Hold on one second. Let's get this. I want to make sure we hear What if they say my name and I have to go somewhere? Detention. Yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty traumatic. In school suspension is where I met some of my best friends that I still have in my life, honestly. They're still there? Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, actually, I visit them all the time. In your head. You were back to that room? That's cool. Wait, where were we? Oh, Joaquin. So I couldn't have made this movie about Joaquin Phoenix. Like, straight up, just capitalism, right? Right. So, so that's an obstacle. The other, for me, honestly, real honest answer that you, that we, I don't think everyone will share, my own depression. Mm my own fear, my own psyching myself out, my own um, thinking it's not going to work out. That, that haunts me. That's hard. And I'm 55. I'm supposedly accomplished, and it still haunts me all the time. 
Is there is there someone or something in your life? You know, you mentioned that you you have a child. Or is there anything that you do in your life that helps you get? Because it's it's a tough space to be in and to get out of. Because sometimes you don't even see it's happening yourself totally. until, until someone taps you on your shoulder and like, hey, you're doing that thing where you haven't left your room in like five days. Or yeah, like, yeah. Is there and what helps you see kind of okay. like the lights? I got a great answer for this. Um, um, well, obviously, there's there's a better. Okay, great. One answer is obviously friends, camaraderie, walking, uh, physicality, like getting out of your head, right? That's kind of simple, basic thing. Here's my trick. A lot of coffee, <laughs> headphones, and blaring music. Blaring music, like one song on repeat all day long for like a month. And then the same song for the Well, it changes if I need, but it can be the same song for phew, but then I'll use this song like, oh, I need to write in this way, so I'll, I'll DJ myself and I'll figure out a thing. Because I, so, I need to get out of my head, and music is, an, is the higher magical order. Like, and music is completely tied to your heartbeat, neurological system, and your connection to everything, I kind of feel like. So it's like tapping into like the bigger source. So it's like I have to enchant myself, I have to like, it's music I love, and I really love music, so it's like, intoxicating yourself with that and getting out of like a normal rational space it's like a chant did did people when you were their age and, and you know just like clearly like brilliant creatively and trying all sorts of different things to get to that uh, space that satisfies you as an artist like did people tell you you were weird did they ever tell you like oh, yeah. you were like um different did you feel different oh yeah Fully. Uh, woof. That's a big weird question. So yes. You know, and so, okay, how do I answer that? So I'm a uh, fairly privileged cis straight white guy. So I have a lot of like um, wind in my sails, right, from culture and society, and yet I can feel completely also outside and messed up and all that, and that comes from many sources, obviously. Um, I got beat up a whole lot, you know what I mean? There's a lot of, uh, I was like, whatever. You can just smell I'm not gonna fight back, right? So you, I'm good, I'm a good target. I wanna go have some fun, right? Um, then, you know, it's really interesting. So even in the punk scene, so the punk scene sort of supposedly the safe place for the outsiders, a lovely space, right? In my version of the punk scene, there's like hardcore punk, like Black Flag, Adolescence, TSOL, that whole world. And then there's like Talking Heads, um, Joy Division. Uh, and in my weird high school scene, liking those bands was illegal. And I would get called an art fag and like beat up for liking the Talking Heads, you know? Uh, so even within the outsider scene, you can find a lot of abusive, normative, judgy, bullying power moves going on, right? Yeah. So it's around everywhere. Wait, it, keeping that in mind, I mean, you put together a film that is just like so precious uh -huh. and like soft and like there's a lot of like flawed characters and you're just watching um, this story through innocent, really innocent eyes and like innocent perspective mm -hmm. of, of a child. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know if there's any questions about the characters, but first I, I just want to ask you, what were you uh, inspired by any films that had like that same kind of like angle um, as you were writing this? Yeah, there's a great film called Alice in the City by Vim Benders that has a man helping uh, like a 10 year old girl. And he's not the parent, but he has to learn how to do it. Can you repeat the name? Alice in the Cities. Alice in the Cities. It's 1973 German guy. Film Vendors makes a lot of beautiful films you might, you might be interested in. And um, that's another thing that helps me. It's like um, finding, I love other filmmakers. Like, do you guys know Patti Smith? You know the singer, right? Patti Smith loves other artists, poets, and things. And she talks about it. And she taught me, like, that's cool and rad to love other things. Do you hang out with Patty Smith? No, no, I read about her, you know. Yeah, I wish. I've tried to copy her style, though. How's yeah, it, going? it looks yeah. good. Yeah. Um, um, so so uh, that's really important. So like having films around that I'm just totally like hugging the whole time and like, I want to be like you. 
Like I, so when I grew up, um, even in my art school, my art college, that was kind of like, that's not cool. You have to be your radical self. You're, a, a, you're alone. If you're a good artist, you're tra trailing, you're doing your own path and no one else did that path. I feel like that's like a road to like psychosis. <laughs> it's like a road to like, yeah. for me, it's the yeah. depressive road. The positive road is like, you're with other people. There's these amazing models out there that can help you. There's, yeah. and, and, and like, even Patti Smith, I'm a poser compared to Patti Smith, but guess what? <laughs> I can like grab onto her music and what she reads and writes and I'm not a poser, right? I can make myself not a poser. I can just say like, I love this and I'm gonna grab onto it and eat it up. And I can, you know? You're describing something so like deeply visceral. I, I, I hope you guys are, are, are taking this in. Do we have any questions specifically about the characters in the, in the movie? Go ahead. Did you have a question that you didn't? Well, I just had a, one question. I think they're gonna ask you to stand up. <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to ask, um, throughout the film, I was really in awe of like, the ability of the actor that played Jesse. Yeah. And I was going to ask what it was like, um, you, obviously you worked with the actress because you were the director, but what was it like um, having like Jesse like, express emotion? Because I know in your dialogue, it goes over a lot of like very mature topics. Yeah. With his acting, it almost felt like these were like his exact thoughts. Like it was not even just dialogue, it was really what he was thinking. Yeah, that's right, right? Um, that's his, so part of that, so that's Woody Norman, he's nine when we made the film. He's from, he's British. He's from London. So he's doing an American accent. He, oh. He's only been to America once before we shot the movie. He's nine, he's like acting with the Joker the whole time, right? And not tripping out. He's just like, well, what do you got? <laughs> you know, he's, and so he has a lot of strength and he's really smart and he has a rad mom who like, doesn't take care of his challenges for him, but is always there with him. I learned a ton from her as a parent. Mm. Um, so some of that is just how good Woody is an actor. He just can take your lines and just like eat it up and, and just live it, right? And it feels, and he's with great actors, right? And that, you can only act as good as the people you're with in movies. This, that's just like a scientific truth. <laughs> um, so he's with these rad people who tee him up to do great things. Sometimes what he's is improvising, or it's like, it's like my line, my line, where my line should be a slightly different version, the same intention, my line, a complete Woody line. Like this, and I encourage that. They're, they're following the same intention of the scene. They're, they're exploring the intention of the scene, but like sometimes from themselves. So like, the one I can always think of really easy is after they read that Star Child book. And so it's my line is like, you're crying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. These are all my lines. And then uh, uh, the stupid book or something like that. I forgot what. And then Woody added, you're stupid. You have the mental ability of a deceased person. That's, that's Woody improvising. What a out there line. And then Joaquin laughing. It's just he's laughing how fucking funny that was, you know? So. So this, there, that happens maybe like 20% of the movie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess. I don't even know how much that happened. But it infects everything else. It makes all my written lines like eight times better because everyone's like really alive. You don't, you don't, I don't know what you're gonna say next. You know, so I'm like really listening. This is super fun, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't eat lunch either, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> this isn't specifically about the characters, but I just have to ask the question. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time I have like a lot of different drives to make something like emotional and meaningful, or like I have that passion to do something like that, but I just don't have the idea yet. How do you find that in what you're talking about? Well, it doesn't, it's not easier. I, can't, I want to ask how old you are, right? Like you, how old are you? Can I ask? Awesome. Great. Um, so you, it would be kind of strange if you could just nail that at 16. Like you're like, that's just normal. That's just, that's, that's just good. <laughs> how do I do that? Um, every film I've made that's at all decent started with someone I really know and love. I wrote a movie kind of about my dad coming out. I wrote a movie kind of about my mom, and this one's kind of about my kid. That's how I do it. Not everyone does it like that, right? And it's very, it, it is, not, not everyone does that. So that's how I like, 
I know what I'm talking about at all, if I do, right? I, and, and I have a lot of feelings about those people, and they're not like resolved. I'm, I'm, I'm making films about the part of them that I don't fully get, and so I have this like hunger to figure it out. And I feel like you could probably describe all my movies as the hunger to figure out blank, you know? Mm -hmm. right. How about in the hat? What was your motivation, or not motivation, that's the wrong word, but the um, like reason for the mom to be as like a character in the um, movie? Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. That? Maybe you're asking that, I don't know, maybe because you sense that actually the movie's kind of all about the mom. Those boys in the movie are figuring themselves out via the mom and how to live, and he's figuring out how to be a parent kind of via the mom and the kid telling stories about the mom. And that's kind of my life. Like, I figured myself out. I'm a guy via my mom, my sisters, my wife, like so many women in my life. And they've been the best allies for me and my particular soul. So I'm always... And I grew up like in a matriarchy. I grew up like powerful mom, powerful sisters, gay dad who never, never took on patriarchal power inside the house, mm. you know? Like he, he wasn't the man man in the house. I kind of was. I'm the only straight guy in my house. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but if I'm going to talk about a man figuring out how to be with a kid, there has to be a mom there for me, personally. Yeah. Let's try to get to a few more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, so that, I, yeah. I, there's, there's some someone over oh, there right. in the corner, right? In the, in the orange. Yes. And, and, and oh, in the sorry. Black, yes. Is it, do you want to go real bad? You guys choose. <laughs> writing a character? Ooh, biggest advice for writing a character. Oh my gosh. I, okay, here's maybe the best answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. And like, you probably know as better as, as I do, honestly. That's, that's pretty good advice, actually. You know as well as I do. Um, best advice for writing a character. So for me, I do it off people I've seen. I have to have a model. That's all. I'm only interested in if it's like, I, I, I love this person. I can see them, and they do actions that I can relate to, and and I it feels like less cuckoo pants <laughs> if there's a real person that I'm kind of bouncing it off of, right? So that's my way. But there's a million ways. I don't know if that was helpful. The person, the person yeah, next yeah, yeah. to you. Yes. Um, how long did it take you to write the script, and then how long did it take you to film? Cool question. So this one was kind of quick. It was only like a year and a half, maybe. I mean, even longer if you really think about, I'm still writing as I'm shooting, I'm still writing as I'm editing. Like, like um, my other films before, it's sometimes it's like two to three years of writing. That's not cool. <laughs> That's hard, and you get really spun out and lost, and, it's, and not everyone takes that long. That's like my problem. That's not your problem. <laughs> and then making the film, it, it's kind of like, it's, what is it? It's like eight to 10 weeks of prep, seven weeks of shooting, 25 to 40 weeks of editing, eight to 10 weeks Ooh. of post. What does that add up to? I don't know, it's like a year and a half. And then usually you stall out, you don't just get to like have your movie come out. So for me, it tends to be like a five year cycle. So if I, when I'm like thinking about making a movie, I'm like, five, the next five years, yeah. like I'm gonna be 60, you know, when my next movie comes out. And that's not true for everyone. A lot of people make like a movie a year. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> How about like in the flannel? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what are your thoughts and like how do you feel about um, your emotional process of like it starting as an idea and growing into this yeah. like actual thing? Yeah. Um, this is a cool that's super cool. All these questions. So what's the process from like when I have the idea to like actualizing it to like releasing it and having people see it, right? Is that right? And like, what's, what's that like? Is that the, like, or what does it feel like? How are your, like, how are your feelings towards that? And like, yeah, how are my feelings towards that? Uh, well, it's been crazy emotional um, bringing the movie out to people because like we've all had our hard years, right? We've all had our, and we've been alone. I edited this movie alone. 
like my editor was in the in Evercast, like in the screen, and I was like alone in a room for 10, 11 months, you know? And editing is very like doing math. It's like a very solo thing. And so when we first started, and I didn't know if I was gonna get to show it to people in real life, right? Because my I have friends who released a movie last year and it's just like goes out onto Netflix or whatever. And I really like people. And so to get to come to a room and show it, like I've been just crying. <laughs> and people think it's like charming. I'm like, no, I'm just fucking crying. Like it's, it's it's, uh, it's really quite trippy and emotional and hard to hold on to. And then I'm in this weird spot. Like if I see the end of the movie, like I often come in the theater at the end to do the Q&A, so I see the end. And, and it's very emotional, but it's also like, I love my kid, I love Joaquin, I love Woody, I love Gabby, like I really do. They're not, like they're friends of mine now. And, and so it's like this amazing community, this amazing people that the film, like I said, brought to me. So super duper emotional. But that whole process, maybe your question is like from the beginning to there. It's so long, it's like years and years. So you have many different things and it's, it's like an endurance race and it goes up and down. And even when it goes well, it's also humiliating. <laughs> you know? uh, even like, like my films, I don't know, whatever. Let's say your film's doing really well. You're gonna get the most stinging critical review in the New York Times or the New Yorker from a very smart person who says something correct about how you're dumb, right? And it's, ooh, that is embarrassing, you know? Uh, and that's just gonna happen, no matter how good it is, you know? So it's a real ride. There's like, and there's not one answer to that. And it's like an endurance thing. So that's part of why I pick movies about people I know and love, because it's like, I'm gonna have to go through the storm for five years. I better be like something that's like, only I can care about. It was something that you just brought up, and we're going to have to close, y'all. I'm so sorry. Um, something that we just brought up is, uh, is that you brought up is the people that come together through your projects. Yeah. And now you're like friends, and um, like I'm, I'm not a spiritual person, but I do like strongly believe in like the power of summoning and people yeah. coming together. You're from the Bay Area. I don't know if you all knew this. Um, all the Bates. Yeah. So what I'm hoping is that we can kind of keep you around here, uh, maybe. Cool. Well, I'll be, I'll be here every week. There's so many um, questions. Yeah. Um, this is really fun. Uh, <laughs> you guys' questions are honestly, like, awesome. And it's just neat to show this film to you all. Let's get a big round of applause for Mike Mills. And come on, come on. Thanks. Thanks for... Um, we want to thank the reps, A24, for bringing this together and all the staff at the Mill Valley Film Festival um, who will help make this happen. Y'all, come see some films this weekend. Look yeah. at that. <laughs> Look at that. That's amazing. Man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah.